morning, Grace Episcopal Church. I am so glad to see you all here today, and I just want to say thank you for your patience as we navigate this decision about in-person gathering. I'm really grateful to say we've had no new cases here at Grace, so that is wonderful news. And so we're starting to come back together, and I appreciate your mask wearing, your being thoughtful about social distancing. This is the way we're going to care for each other so that we can eventually get to this other side that we've all been waiting for for so long where we can be all together without fear or anxiety. So thank you for the patience and the care that you are extending to each other. I also want to say thank you to those of you that have taken note of the letter that went out from Ben Scales, your senior warden, about uh, pledges. Thank you so much for those of you that have been catching up on your pledge. This is crucial for us because this is where our cash flow comes every month for us to be able to pay our bills and our staff. So um, if you're behind in your pledges, we have, we're behind in our cash flow. So thank you so much for paying attention to that. We've gotten several um, updates on statuses, so let us know if anything has changed for you. Um, we're here always to talk to you about your pledges and about the income if you ever want to speak with us about that. So thank you. Tonight, there is a Taze service at 8 o'clock, so please, if you've never been to this service, uh, come and join us tonight at 8. It's a lovely time of gathering and centering, um, so thank you for paying attention to that. Next Sunday, the pumpkins arrive! We are so excited to once again be the beautiful church that has the pumpkins on the lawn and to welcome our neighbors as we raise money for Consider Haiti. So thank you for paying attention to this as well. And we would love to have your support next Sunday in unloading the trucks uh, uh, with all these pumpkins and ju to just be in fellowship together as we do that would be wonderful. So thank you very much. And all of these announcements are in your bulletin so you can take a look at them there. Wherever you find yourself worshiping God today, whether it is here with us in person or online, I invite you to take a moment uh, to just simply be grateful that we each have set aside this time to center ourselves in the presence of the holy and in relationship with each other. So thank you for being with us at Grace. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen.
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayers. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. We will now read in unison Psalm 54. Save me, O God, by your name. In your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For the arrogant have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life, those who have no regard for God. Behold, God is my helper. It is the Lord who sustains my life. Render evil to those who despise me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will offer you a free will sacrifice and praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from every trouble, and my eye has seen the ruin of my foes.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. Taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God. Amen. I can vividly remember working as a year-long intern at a wonderful, warm, and exceptionally chaotic Episcopal church during my first year of seminary. One Sunday, I was sitting in my chair on the chancel behind the pulpit while our senior warden approached the lectern to read the day's epistle. So he stepped up, grabbed the lectern, and he hunched over the microphone before clearing his throat. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. He pauses for a brief moment before he sticks his finger in the air and he declares, and you know, I really have no clue what Paul was thinking when he wrote this. He then goes through with the reading and he goes back to his seat like this is, of course, what we did every Sunday morning. And of course, I had to let out a big laugh while he openly opined on whatever Paul's word was for that day. I laughed because it was unexpected, but more than that, I laughed because I thought the same exact thing. I didn't really like what Paul had to say that day either. He was saying what many of us already thought. Oftentimes, preaching that's worth its salt is about saying something that's hard. A preacher has not done their job if they have ignored difficult texts, difficult conversations, difficult moments in history. More than the job of just a preacher, though, this is the task of all of God's faithful. From the biblical stories that we remember at lectern and in the aisle, to holy conversations that we share as a church and a society today. Honest faith cannot exclude difficult conversation. But there is no doubt in my mind that saying what is difficult comes with a cost. That might be part of what makes James so controversial. James has a lot to say. James has hard things to say. It's no mistake that this epistle from the literal brother of Jesus is one of the forgotten pieces of our New Testament canon. From early church leaders through the Reformation, James was viewed with a healthy dose of skepticism. Fourth century historian Eusebius counted the uh, the epistle of James among his contested books of the Bible. And in the midst of the Reformation, minimally influential priest and theologian Martin Luther remarked, St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle, 
are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and salutary for you to know, even if you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. Therefore, St. James' epistle is really just an epistle of straw compared to the others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. James had hard things to say. James was controversial. But make no mistake about it, Paul had his haters too. In addition to disagreements with James, Paul's incident at Antioch is described in scripture, wherein he and Peter have a heated argument. In the early church, there was even an entire sect of believers referred to as Ebionites, who were modeled on the teaching of James and the belief that they rejected Paul as a false apostle. More recently, many who searched to restore or to reclaim the faith of the early church charged Paul with distorting the teachings of Christ and hastening Christianity's comfort with empire. They refer to this tradition of emphasizing Paul at the expense of Jesus by the pejorative term Paulism. Like James, Paul had hard things to say. Paul was controversial. And if it isn't clear enough by now, here's the point. Paul and James are understood by many as diametrically opposed. There are clear camps. Do you love Paul or do you love James? And frankly, I have always been Team James. I appreciate James's urgency. I love the clarion call to care for the poor and the notion that we cannot truly live out our faith until we come into meaningful encounter with those on the margins. I love that James gets us up off of our butts. So I will always remember in my discernment to come here to grace. I would sit in the back if I hit every light correctly on Merriman after my other job, I could slink in, in what Millie likes to refer to as my outfit. It's a dirty t-shirt and running shorts. And, and I would sit in my outfit in the back and I would listen to Millie preach. And as I listened to her sermons, I got increasingly more comfortable with the idea of joining this community. I remember coming to church on my birthday it was the first day that Grace was allowed 100% capacity. And I was eagerly listening as Millie began her first sermon before a full church. So she began. So I will just tell you right now, I love Paul. I couldn't believe it. Millie and Paul? I almost sprung up from my pew, but I sat. And I listened, and as I listened, I came to understand what she was trying to say. The message gave me a new perspective on Paul. I heard he didn't always have the right answers, but he had the courage to tackle all of the right questions. Paul had the courage to take on hard conversations. So here it is. I love James, and... I, I love Paul. There, I said it. I love that James confronts urgency, challenging Christ's body to hold true to their word, to prioritize the widow and the orphan. But I love that Paul confronts reality. He challenges us to be aware of limitation, to stop short of simply believing that humans can tailor a world to perfection if only we can tinker enough, if only we try harder, if only we work more. Paul teaches us humility. His understanding of grace reminds us that we are indeed in need of it. We need grace. We need faithful and radical works, both of these things are true. Both are true. That is one of the more difficult things for me to say. Whether we're talking about something as ridiculous as condiment choices on a hot dog or as consequential as theology, it's difficult to say, yes, both. It's difficult, I think, because it causes us to reflect 
to explore with nuance, to avoid narratives in which there are clear heroes and clear villains, narratives where we are so very sure of ourselves. Both are true. It's inefficient because it's contemplative, but it's the kind of thinking that I truly believe Jesus calls us into. Jesus requires us to exist somewhere between the material and the immaterial, between yes and no, between clear-cut answers and expectations, and so often we are not ready to meet him there. This is a timeless problem that we grapple with today, just as the apostles did in today's gospel. It is a problem of our nature. Jesus presents the apostles with an apparent contradiction the Son of Man will be betrayed and killed. In other words, God's power will be expressed through humiliation, through suffering, through death, and yes, eventually through resurrection. This is how God will choose to be made known in the world. And how did the disciples respond to this apparent contradiction? They did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him, that might be the most relatable sentence in the Bible. They, were, they didn't understand, and they were afraid to ask them. Clear and easy answers are so often attached to the preservation of our own egos. So it is no surprise that Jesus, far from clear and easy answer, elicits a strong ego response from disciples. They were afraid that they didn't know, And so they had to show outwardly that they absolutely did know. Excuse me, sir, but I am the greatest. But, Peter, you know you are going to, you know, deny Jesus. Well, but I am the greatest, right? And so on and so forth. And Jesus, listening to this entire insanity, knows it's time for a hard conversation. But I want to give a special notice to how he invites them in to hard conversation. He doesn't admonish. And again, he doesn't give the disciples a clear and easy answer. There is no instruction manual. He invites them in to contemplation with yet another riddle. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Paradox, contradiction, mystery. This is what we are called into if we wish to grow closer to Christ. And it is so entirely evident everywhere that we look in our faith, death and suffering, resurrection, bread and wine, body and blood, flesh and finality, spirit and eternity. This is a different approach to hard conversation. Like James and Paul, we may be called to approach these challenges by different avenues. After all, Paul did tell us in 1 Corinthians, indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. We all need one another. And I suspect in this time of change for our society and for our church, there are many hard conversations to be had, of course. Let this model of exploring through contemplation guide us as we seek to grow closer to Christ in our own hearts and in our community. Let us work hard and expect the best from one another as James might, and let us do so with Paul's sense of grace and of mercy always in the forefront of our minds. As early church father John Chrysostom reminds us, even if we stand at the very summit of virtue, it is by mercy that we shall be saved. Let us work as many members of one body, striving together in joy and in mercy, showing our deep love of Christ to one another and in all the world. Amen. Amen. Standing together, let us give voice to the faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshiped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, Form 3, are found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer and in your bulletin. God of all mercy, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We ask your prayers for Cliff, Pat, Sally, Jim, Dorothy, Eunice, Mercy. Sherry, Don and Ann, Nancy, Sonny, Laura and GN, Pat and Nancy, Barbara and Don. Are there others? Let us pray for all who have birthdays last week and this week. Devin Engelbrecht, James Engelbrecht, the Reverend Alex Comfort, Mark Silvers, Charlie Scales, Emmeline Scales, Tricia Hargrove, Angie Cullen, Carol McClellan, Pat Davis, Glenn Haller, Alice McKenzie, Richard Jacobs, Bailey Frew, Cameron Frew, Peggy Carey, and Maya Bell. And for all who are celebrating anniversaries, Larry and Lucy Bowen, Brett and Susie Young, Monty Wooten and Cheryl Dayton, Robert and Bonnie Kistler, and Eric and Karen Howell. Let us pray for those who have recently departed. Francis Hanna, Veronica Litton, Horace Townsend, and Barbara Wojcik, Martha Sue Carlock. And for these on the anniversaries of their deaths, <coughs> Sherry Coward, W. Edward Nash, James Wooten, Carolyn Plowden, Lucretia Warren, Arthur Court, Alice Miller, Will Army, 
Catherine V. Bohan, and Mary Post. Gracious and loving God, you know our needs before we speak them. We thank you for the healing that you offer us. We thank you for each other in this living as community and the healing that we receive here in this place. Grant us open hearts and open minds to the healing you have available for us in every breath. And grant us the courage to simply follow you. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace. 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 What a lovely song. Peace, Kathy. You're getting a musical break. Let us now offer to God the fruits of our labor and our love.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all of the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation. In the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son, for in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father,
Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. This is the table of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love and for those who want to love more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have fallen short, come because it is the risen Christ who invites you. It is the risen Christ who wants to meet you here. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Standing or kneeling, let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. In the name of God and this congregation, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body because we all share the word, one bread and one cup. Amen. Friends, life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those that walk the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to show mercy, and may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Friends, our liturgy has ended, and so now our service begins. Let us go out into the world to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>